All right. Happy Friday. Okay, so how's everyone? Good. All right. So let's uh, start today with example eight. And uh, while your friends are arriving, if you can spend a couple of minutes, read the question and try to figure out how you can solve it. Try to see what the quest, uh, example eight is asking and what's the mechanism, how we can approach this problem. All right, so let's uh, see how we can approach this problem together, all right? So first of all, uh, let's take a look at the, at the general motion of this system. We have a car and we know this car is symmetric in normal to your screen. That's uh, one assumption that we can have. Uh, of course, in real life, maybe cars are not symmetric, um, but we can assume it it's symmetric, so it's a 2D problem. Then. So we can look at half of the car here. And also from uh, like in this problem, it says that the center of gravity is exactly in the middle. Uh, also, uh, if you look at the, uh, like the wheelbase from center to center and the distance from peak to peak on the road, they are exactly the same. So it means when this car moving along this road, front and rear tires are gonna move ups and down together, okay? Which is unusual, but it's a simplified version of a problem that we will see in future. So for us, it means that the whole car is gonna move ups and down without any tilting, right? It means one degree of freedom is good for us, just moving ups and down. But in future, when we solve more general problems, when the wheelbase and the road peak to peak, they are not exactly the same. Maybe the front tire goes up, the back tires go down or opposite or something similar, all right? So for that, then I can only solve the problems for quarter of these car. So I can assume that I have, let's say uh, a box or a mass, Do I have something here? No, that's not All right. So we can assume that I have a mass, all right? This mass is on a spring and so far this mass is M a quarter of the total mass of this uh, car, 1800 divided by four, all right? So that's a mass. So we are looking at the quarter model. And then I can think of the base moving ups and down. Let me try. So I can think of the base moving ups and down with the function yt. I'm just gonna convert it to the time. So I know it's a sinusoidal motion. The base is moving ups and down. So it should have a form, maybe something like B sine or cosine omega t. 
but I don't know what is this omega. Maybe I can figure it out. Let's take a look at the velocity of this car. So the velocity is V. So I know the time that it takes for this car to, for example, go from peak to peak. Let's say this is the peak. Uh, and then this is also the peak. Right, so let's call this one time. to travel from peak to peak. Let's call this one T and we know this T is equal uh, L divided by V because velocity is constant. The distance from peak to peak is L. And so we can figure out the time that it takes to go from peak to peak. This omega then, I know it is two pi over t, right? And t is the period for one complete cycle. Yes. Why is the here the length L instead of two thirds L? Because there's three peaks, but it's two L away from each other. So each peak is going to be two thirds L. No, no, no. Why? Why like that? So see from peak here to peak here is one L, and then from peak there to there is another L, it's two L. It, it just shows the car move a little bit away from here. Right? So then it will be two pi, we just found T, let's show it by T here. So I replace it by L over V, all right then I would get, so this is two pi, I would get two pi V over L. Let's put everything up there. Okay, so, and we assume that this car is not gonna tilt or do anything. It just moves up and down. So I can assume that it is inside the rail and one motion X can describe the movement of these uh, car. So we call this one, let's say a quarter moment. which is very common when people analyze the vibration of a car uh, to just consider a quarter model, right? at least to start with. So again, I repeat, we look at the dynamic of this system because of the, uh, let's say the exact length, the, the length of the from wheel to wheel, the center and the uh, distance from peak to peak on the road, they are exactly the same, which means this car the front and rear tires, they're gonna move up and down together. So it means this car is not gonna have any tilt motion, right? It is unusual, but this is a simplified version of this car model. Center of the mass is in the middle. Also, we know the car is symmetric uh, in like in the screen or in your paper. Um, so we can then assume, just consider a quarter of this car. So half of quarter and then the stiffness of these for each wheel, the question says the stiffness is 35,000, right? So this is K. So 35,000 Newton per meter. So this is a problem that now I have. I have a mass spring and the base is has, it has a motion. So instead of you thinking that the car is moving, you can think that the car is being fixed. This is what I did, right? I assume the car is being fixed. So the road is moving underneath of that to the left. So if you can imagine that motion, then you can think uh, that, all right, it is as if somebody is 
holding that point and move it up and down with this base motion. Y t is equal to B cosine omega t. So far it's clear. Are we good? Because that's all that it takes for this problem to solve. The rest is something that you already know how to solve. So first of all, try to understand the problem correctly. This is what happened. And then try to model it as more like a mass and a spring system. This is what we did. So if you are okay with this part, then the rest, we know how to solve it because we know it's a base motion system. And we already found the equation for base motion, mx double dot plus kx is equal to kb cosine omega t, which omega for us is two pi v over l t. All right, so this is our omega. So we have all the information that we want. We have B, we have velocity V, be careful about unit. We are working with meter and seconds. So and then V is 40, every kilometers is 1000 meter and every hours is 3,700 seconds. So it means 40 divided by 3.6 meter per second. So I have velocity, I have L, uh, two pi, obvious. So, and then the rest of information as well. I have K and I have B. And just be careful also about B. B should be 0 0.25 meter. Okay, so then I can find xt. So xt will be x, right? Cosine omega t, which again, omega is what we have. And x has a standard formula, which is f0 divided by k, one minus omega, omega squared, which again, I have everything. And this time my F zero is this K multiplied by B. This is my F zero. All right, remember always we have this standard equation and the solution. We just need to know what is M, what is K, and what is the uh, static force and what is the forcing frequency. Right? Four important parameters then. One is the mass or equivalent of the mass. Here is just mass, but sometimes it's not mass. It's something else, but whatever coefficient it is, we call it mass. Another is a stiffness. Then we need F zero. And then we need omega, which we call it forcing frequency. The rest is just a standard solution. So that's xt. I leave the calculation to you to substitute that. That should be easy. But this question also asks us to find the critical speed, like a speed that the vibration is going to go to the maximum. Maybe this car jumps up and down, and something bad will happen. And we know the vibration goes to maximum. And again, this equation also tells us like at critical speed. We know omega is equal to omega n, right? The forcing frequency and natural frequency are the same. So omega, we know it is two pi V, but this time we call it V critical because we don't know what is the value divided by L is equal to the square root of k over n. From here, I can find v critical. But you can substitute the values and find the critical speed.
Well, it seems simple as we get the, uh, the first part of the question right. If you have the model, then the rest seems straightforward. Okay, so now question, if any part is not clear. So when you are quiet, it means two things, either it is super simple or maybe okay, answers. So remember here, we, we got omega, right? And this omega is a function of V speed, right? Which we solve it for the problem and we are done. You know, if this car is moving with this speed for 40 kilometers per hour, we will get this vibration. We will get this vibration, X T omega cosine, uh, X uh, cosine omega T, and the amplitude of vibration is this value. Right? That's with the normal speed. Now we are curious to see if there is a critical speed. And what is a critical speed? A speed that vibration goes crazy. If you look at only the math, we realize that vibration can go crazy if omega is equal to omega n, right? Remember when we talk about resonance, we said if omega and omega n, they are equal, the system goes to resonance and the vibration goes crazy. So for us to find the critical speed or the speed that vibration goes goes crazy, then we just need to set omega equal to omega n. We know the value of omega, we know the value of omega n. From here, we will find the speed, the speed that omega and omega n, they are equal. That speed, we call it a critical speed. That's just the terminology that we use. But to be maybe more accurate, we say that the critical speed is a speed that the natural frequency of the system and the forcing frequency, they becomes equal. Okay, any other question? All right, I assume that you are good. Okay, I'll just give you a moment to take notes before I move to the next topic. I asked your TA today with a different person. Uh, today, your TA, so they are rotating with Jacob, and uh, I strongly encourage you to attend this session. There is a little bit of mismatch um, because, um, like, the weekend is on Monday, half of you will have your TA today. So, if you could attend that TA, that would be nice. If not, then he's going to post his note today and you can also ask him. I ask him to solve the one extra problem for you. So I strongly encourage you try to attend this session. So you could also have questions. Uh, because the Monday after the exam is still good, but it's still after the exam. Um, yes, yeah, so that's about your tutorial. Because the first question in tutorial three is related to Yahoo which we haven't yet covered. So I ask you to skip that question, solve question two, plus an extra problem for you, which will be a good practice for your future homework. Could you say that this example was the kind of the topic we looked No, we don't need it. For your weekend, whatever we cover up to uh, Wednesday. Not up to, like the uh, end of Wednesday. Okay, so example seven. Correct. But remember in vibrations, the problems are like different. You can, uh, we, can, we can design like maybe 1000 different problems from one topic, right? Okay, so let's move on to the steady state response of uh, rotating on balance, which is uh, again, one of uh, important topics in vibrations. Why this is important? Because in mechanics, we have a lot of rotating systems. And most of them, they are unbalanced, even by a slight amount, which create noise, they create noise and vibration. And we wanna see how we can tackle this problem, all right? So that's our goal. So 
Again, first things first, let's deal with the, uh, understand the model before we get to the math. All right. So imagine I have um, a machine, uh, maybe a washing machine, a dryer, maybe a motors, a gearbox, something, something that has a rotating system. In it. And let's say this box, the whole thing has a mass M, all right? So this washing machine, let's say has a mass M. And inside that uh, box, there is a rotating system, which that rotating system um, has mass MR. So this MR is already included in this M. So as I weight the whole thing, it's gonna be M, not M plus MR. So this is then the total mass included MR. So MR like a stand for rotating mass, the mass that is rotating. And imagine this mass has like it's not rotating at the center exactly. It has like an eccentric distance, which is E. This E can be very, very small, like in order of one thousands of millimeters, but still it creates vibration. So you can imagine the whole things here to be a propeller. Let's say something like that. And Ideally, we wish the center of mass to be exactly at the center that is rotating. But no matter how accurate we uh, design and then manufacture these propeller, and then when we install it, the center of mass of these things is probably is gonna have a distance E. And again, this E might be in an order of like 1000s of millimeter not meter, 1,000 of millimeter. If you are really, really good, we go with a very expensive, uh, let's say investment casting for this propeller, still you get some distance E. So it's inevitable and you're gonna have it. For some machine is bigger, for some is small. So imagine, but now for just the sake of discussion, I show this E like large, but it can be very small. So far, this is what we have. And then imagine this system is rotating with omega. That's the rotation speed. So this is all like the system that we have. Uh, we were lazy, we didn't show this wheel on the side, but suppose that we can find the motion of this system only to the vertical motion. So imagine there are like rails here no friction or anything. And this mass can go ups and down. The fact that we just show one X here, it implies that this system is gonna have only one motion moving ups and down. However, later we'll see when we get to two or three or more degrees of freedom, this system also can move sideways. But for now, if it shows just one X, it means only one variable one degree of freedom. So that's the system that we are dealing with. The system is at equilibrium, uh, which means the weight of the whole things creates some compression in the spring. Okay, so far clear? So this is the system that we have. Now we have to find a way to mathematically describe the system. Like always, we start with a free body diagram. So based on this X that I showed here, moving up, it means I'm implying the whole system is moving by X. So I will have a force in a spring, which is KX. Again, I emphasize there is no, uh, let's say constraint, how to choose this direction X. If you wish, you can show it down, doesn't matter. The only difference between these two equations will be a negative sign somewhere at the very end, which we can deal with that easily. But the rest you need to be accurate. So if you show it, this X is going up, then it means there is a tension in a spring. So and that tension is KX. So that part you should, you should uh, draw it accurate. So what else? I know this uh, 
mass MR create like a force which we know how to calculate it. It is MR E omega squared, right? The centrifugal force. And whenever we have a mass M, right? You've learned it in dynamics. Whenever we have a mass M, that mass M rotating about, let's say, center, So let's say this is MR and this is E. We know that there is a force and that force is MR E multiplied by omega, which is the speed square. I believe you agree with that part, right? You've seen it in dynamics. What I did, this force, I just, uh, extended showed it that it's applied to the center because we are dealing with a rigid system um, so i can slide this load and i can claim that this load is being applied to the bearing at all okay, so far you're good at any step if it's not clear please let me know What's the direction of that? All right, that's a very good question. What is the direction of that load, right? It's not gonna be constant, it's rotating, right? So if you look at this theta, because the whole system is moving, now you can visualize what exactly is happening. This load is not gonna be constant. Uh, the direction is not gonna be stay the same as these Machine is rotating, this force sometimes is up, sometimes is down. So you can now visualize that it's gonna create some vibration. Do you agree? So to answer your question, the direction of this thing is not constant. It's just moving. It depends on this theta. But this theta, we can find the relation for this theta and time. You know, this theta is equal omega t. Okay, because the, the whole system is rotating with omega. Let's assume that this omega is constant. So maybe that can clear it up better. If I find the component of this force, so what do I get? Component of this force will be let me do a little job here. Okay. Uh, so the component of this force in X and in Y direction will be like this is the horizontal and this is the vertical component. And this vertical component is gonna be M R E omega squared sine theta. So we have the free body diagram. I just care about the direction in X is M x double dot. Remember we showed x, like this is x direction. You, you could have called it y if you used to call the vertical direction y. So what do I have in x direction? I have uh, minus kx, the opposite direction, plus mr e omega squared sine I can replace omega theta by omega t is equal to m x double dot. So if I simplify this problem, m x double dot plus k x is equal to m r e omega square sine omega t. And this is where the magic happens because again, we get to the same familiar equations that we 
had before. It is just the shape of uh, the mass and the stiffness and the F0 changed. All right, so and we don't care about this component on X direction. This is MR E omega square cosine theta, right? We have a vertical and horizontal force. The horizontal force is just going to apply load to the, the to the wall, which we don't care for now. Uh, we're going to be worried about it later. We just care about direction in X in vertical directions. What do I have? In that direction, I have a force and I have a Kx. So I hope you guys can visualize what's really happening. This load MRE omega squared sine theta, as ANSYS asked, that it goes ups and down, right? It goes ups and down. Right now it is up. A moment later, because the whole system is rotating, it's going to be down and pressing this system down. So you can visualize really a vibration is happening. And the math also proved that one. This is the equation of motion, which for us, we know how to deal with this equation. Yes. Sir. What is the sine theta of the vertical component of the force? Uh, Supersized theta? Uh, no, no, no. This theta, okay, that's also a good question. So as Alberto said right here, we have a theta, right? But remember this theta is not a small, it is between zero to 360 degree. It's, it's changed, it's keep changing around, right? That theta is different than if you solve, let's say a pendulum problem. When you solve a pendulum problem, um, Let's say you have a pendulum problem and this pendulum problem, maybe we are curious to understand its vibration theta. So it's swing left and right, left and right is a small theta, it's, it's one degree. But here we have the whole theta, right? It's going two pi, it's going around. We cannot um, simplify it. All right, so how should we proceed now with this equation? Again, you know, each of these elements, we know that in this equation, this is my mass M, this is the stiffness, so this is the system mass, this is the system stiffness, and this guy over here is our F0, okay? And this omega is our forcing frequency. See this omega now changing shape. In the previous example that we saw, that omega, okay, I'm going to move back. The omega had something to do with the velocity, the road like velocity. Right? In this example that we saw, this omega has something to do with the rotation of the system. It can be anything uh, that we apply low. So now let's solve this equation. We know that the steady state response, remember again, as we said uh, on Monday, uh, we care mainly about the steady state response, not the transient response. Xt is x, sine omega t. I write sine because my equations here is sine, right? This is also sine. If that one was cosine, this one was also cosine. Because we said they, they are in phase. What does it mean they are in phase? It means when the force is upward, the whole system is moving up. And when it is down, the whole system is moving down. So these two are moving together which is obvious, it is intuitive in this example, you can feel it, right? When the mass is up, the whole system 
try to lift everything up. But later when we add damping to this system, these two are not going to be in phase, but luckily now they are in phase. So X, we have a formula for that. It is F0 divided by K, one minus omega over omega N squared. If you notice, I'm just using one formula over and over again, right? Let's substitute this value there and see what we get. So F0 is MR E omega squared divided by K one omega N squared. Just gonna manipulate this, this uh, equation a little bit, see if I can make it nicer because right now I don't feel okay. I feel like I have everything scattered. Right? So why not we multiply the whole things? Let me bring it down. So why not we multiply everything up there by an M and divide by an M? Okay, so I multiply everything by M, divide everything by M there. So I can notice that I have an M over K here. Okay, which I know omega N is square root of K over M. So therefore I'm lucky and I can include, this is X, if I, let's not be lazy and write down X. Otherwise I'm gonna make a mistake, no. So it's gonna be then MR E and then M omega omega N square, one minus omega omega N square. Better. So I can now write down X multiplied by M divided by E and R is, I just manipulate this equation to make it nicer, nothing special. Or, no, I like it, this is better. We can plot it, we can um, interpret it and make some nice conclusion out of it. Always when you develop this equation, take a look at the, like try to analyze the units. So if you look at the units on the left, what is the unit on the left? Whatever uh, quantity we have there. The unit on the left for this one is no unit, right? So that's what we like. So we try to get rid of units because then we can interpret things how like we can compare two systems when there is no unit, we can compare. So. And again, the whole things here, we call it a magnification factor. Or MF to stand for magnification factor. So why we call it magnification factor? Because um, we can now analyze the system and compare it to say how big it is. If the magnification factor is one, it means that X multiplied by M divided by E over MR is gonna be equal to one, or it's gonna be equal to two. If it is equal to 100, definitely it is, it means a lot of vibrations. Also, we can plot the whole things. So like always, we care about the amplitude or the magnitude. So we put the whole things inside the absolute bracket. And let's just quickly plot 
this m as a function of omega over omega n. And this is m f. For m, some in, in your textbook, it might have been shown by just m. So what is this m? It is, remember, it is x multiplied by m divided by e multiplied by m r. So it means if you have this number, you can do your calculation. For example, you can find x because remember, we are interested in finding x because that can help us to find the equation of motion. So let's quickly plot these things. And we know how it looks like. It's very similar to what we had before. So usually something like this is one and this is also is equal to one, right? I know when the first thing is omega is zero, we are zero. Okay. Remember this point is omega equal to zero. This point means omega is equal to zero or no rotation, right? System is at equilibrium, nothing is happening, everything is zero. As the speed increase, it goes up to infinity when omega is equal to omega n, and then it rotates back to one. So like always at omega equal to omega n, we have now something that we can call it a critical speed. So with each rotation, rotating system, there is a speed which we can, we call it critical speed. Okay, so this is omega equal to omega n, which we can call it critical speed. Right? So there is a certain speed with all the rota rotating system that at that speed, the system is going to go crazy, lots of vibration, lots of noise. And it is interesting that if you increase or decrease that speed a little bit, the whole noise and vibration goes away or becomes a small. But right, that's all we need for this rotating system. Uh, a good application of these is like example nine, which I want you guys to go over it before the Wednesday session. Uh, and also take a look at the MATLAB code that I put on, on Canvas. Um, so try to write the equation for this one and please do that. So on Wednesday, when I solve it, you could compare what's happening. So the whole story is we have like a mass M of this machine. Inside that, there is like a drum and the cloth inside it with mass M, and they are rotating, but they are not at the center. Like the uh, center of that is not at the uh, center of rotation. So it caused that, if I zoom, it caused that uh, extra eccentric rotation, right? which exactly is similar to what we had here. So you should be able to develop the equation and see how it looks. All right, so with that, we close the today lecture. If you have any question, I'll wait outside. Yes, please. Could you say outside? So this is like this centrifugal force. No, this is always upward. That's the centrifugal acceleration going inside. Depends on what we, yeah, exactly. Like when you have a rotating system, you have a tangential acceleration and you have a normal acceleration, right? When you show it as a centrifugal force, it is always going up, up. Okay, thank you very much. Again, do not forget your um, tutorial today is important. Maybe you should attend that if you can. And good luck with your exam on Monday. And please be on time on Monday. Thank you.
kind of say the class notes before the end of the day? So yeah, yeah, I will. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I go off uh, like the whole office, okay. I do. Perfect. Thank you.